Hi, I'm the Ish Girl, and you're listening to Episode 5 of Connection, Not Perfection. Welcome to Connection, Not Perfection, the podcast that helps parents and teens connect using literature, laughter, and love. Hey guys, I am so glad that you are here with me today. My name is Amy. I'm also known as the Ish Girl. And today we are talking about a very provocative question. How well do you really know your teen? This question came to mind recently when I helped administer a survey for a group of middle schoolers that I volunteer with. Now, um, this was a totally anonymous survey and it was over a variety of different topics. And as I read through the survey after the kids finished it and was compiling all the answers and looking at the data, I really wondered, I started to wonder, would these kids' parents answer the way the kids did? And and what I mean by that is kind of the whole newlywed game show. I don't know if you guys remember that from the 70s and 80s where um, newlyweds would go on a show and they'd try to answer questions the way they thought their new spouse would answer them. And so I really wondered as, as I read these answers, would these parents have answered the questions for their kids the way they the same way that the kids answered them. Did they know how their kids would answer the questions? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So that led me to thinking about how well do I really know my teens? Because one of my kids did participate in this survey. So how well do I really know my teen? And I hope the answer is really well, but how do I make sure of that? That's what we're gonna look at today. Now, one of the things that I'm often asked by friends who know that I used to be a middle school teacher and who also know that I love to read, probably it's more they know I love to read young adult books. That's probably the main reason. But they ask, is this book appropriate for my kid? And truthfully, I can't answer that. I cannot answer that question. So when I'm asked that, what I do is I try to give more information about the book to that friend instead. I might say, look, well, this book deals with mental illness, or um, there's some sex in this book, but it's not explicit, or there's a violent scene towards the end, or, or whatever it is that's part of the books. And the reason I do that is because I truly believe that parents are the only ones who can answer that murky question of appropriateness. And here's why. Every teen is different. And hear me on that. Every teen is different. And so what might be right for my 14-year-old might not be right for your 15-year-old. And what um, what I think is not appropriate for my 16-year-old, you might feel like is appropriate for your 13-year-old you have to know your own kid. And and that's the next thing is that no one knows your teen like you do. And and I would say, we've known our kids, you know, have known your child inside out from the time that they were born. But when your kids hit your their teens, all of a sudden, you're kind of in the dark. But I promise you that child inside of that teenage body is still yours. Something that's been really helpful for me to remember is that in um, all my training as a middle school teacher and the research that I've done is that if you think about a baby, a newborn baby, and the changes that that infant goes through in the first three years of their life. So you think about what a newborn looks like and what a three-year-old looks like and you think about how their capacity to um, think and communicate and how they've learned to walk and all of the physical and mental changes that they've gone through in those three years. So you take the idea of that, that drastic change over the course of three years, which if you think about it is, is such a fast rate of growth. You take that the idea of that and then look at a teenager. You look at kids who are maybe 12 or 13 and then look at what they look like at 15 or 16 and that same kind of three-year time span. Those are the same kind of changes that are going on in your teenager. Their brains are changing. Their bodies are changing. Everything is different. So just the same way that your 
three-year-old is not the same little person that they were when they were three months old or six months old. Neither is your 16-year-old the same child that he was at 13 or 14. And it sounds logical when you kind of pull back and look at it that way. But when you're walking through it with your own child, it's it's so much easier to forget all the drastic changes that they're going through. And, and so I that is so helpful for me to remember as I'm parenting is that what my child liked yesterday or thought yesterday or um, or whatever is not necessarily going to be the same. And if you don't keep up, it can really frustrate your kid. And the harder we try to put our teens back in the box of their childhood selves, the harder they're going to fight to climb out. So um, the best road to connection is the one where you get to know who they are now, even if that's changing every five minutes. So, um, and that's the next thing is it's your job to stay in the know, even when it's hard, even when it's changing often. So you really have to pay attention to who your teen is in this moment. You need to be present with them and engage in conversations that span beyond the housekeeping items of things like homework and chores and schedule coordination. Um, And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I struggle with that, with being present with my kids, especially during those weeks when it seems like we're running from one thing to the next. And my only conversations with them involve lists, like, are your chores done? Is your homework finished? Is your uniform clean? Like all, all of those housekeeping things. I find that it's only when I get very deliberate that I can enjoy the people that they are becoming and get to know who that really is. Along those lines, I have some strategies that might be helpful in being more intentional and deliberate with um, with your teens. This has worked for me with my teens, and these are not always things that I do consistently, but I do try. So here they are. First of all, if you can schedule weekly dates with your teens, and for me, um, the way that I, I worked this out uh, is... I have a flexible work schedule, and so I'm able to pick my kids up from school, and once a week for each child, so twice a week for me, I um, have an hour and a half to two hours where I take them, and we can go wherever they choose. They can get food, they can get coffee, they can get sodas, whatever they want, and we just sit and chat, no agenda, just hanging out. And what's been surprising for me is to find out how much both my teens look forward to our time together, to the point where... If we've had to cancel or reschedule, it, it's a huge disappointment and, and upsets them, even during those seasons when it seems like they really wanted nothing to do to me, nothing to do with me at all. So, um, so I would say that's kind of my my number one thing is is having those weekly dates with them. And even if I can't have like the full hour and a half to two hours, even if we can grab half an hour of going and um, just running through a drive through grabbing a soda and sitting in the car and talking for a little bit and connecting. Um, that's, it's just priceless. The other thing I love to do with my kids, and this is a little quirk of mine. Um, for me, I love all the different ways that researchers, researchers have found to categorize humanity. And so taking personality tests together is super fun. I secretly get a little thrill whenever I see where I kind of belong on on these different tests, whether it's the Myers-Briggs, which I'm an ENFP, by the way, and things like the Enneagram test and uh, looking at love languages. Um, There are just tons out there. And um, and I actually have a resource that provides some links to those different fun personality quizzes. If you want to check that out, I'll talk more about that later. But um, I'm on my website. So the other thing to remember about that is a lot of times, like we said, your our teens are changing so frequently. So their personalities might not necessarily be gelled completely, but it's still fun to take these tests and even see how they change. Um, older teens have a little bit more set personalities. You know, things are still somewhat fluid, but really sharing these quizzes with them gives me an insight into what they're thinking and how they're feeling in a lot of ways. In fact, just as an example of this, a friend of mine um, 
we were talking about these online personality quizzes and she shared that she was taking one online and her teenage son came up and was sitting with her and talking to her and watched her do it. And then when she was done, he was so excited. He was like, please do me, do me, do me. Let me go through this test. So so it can be really fun and enjoyable to do that together. And, and it's a simple thing. Lots of fun ones to try online. And then they're also... Um, There are also a lot of books that you can use as well. So um, again, in my show notes, I'll, I'll give you a link to a page that shows some of my favorites. Another idea that I've used, and a friend of mine uh, shared this several years ago when my um, my kids were younger and her kids were teenagers and, and that's journal swapping. I actually started this with my daughter. I, I think I tried it with my son and it wasn't really his thing and that was okay, but it's a shared journal where my daughter and I write back and forth to each other. So it's really a place where she can ask questions that she might be hesitant to speak out loud. And it gives us both time to process before we answer. And since we're writing it down, it gives us a lot of time to think. And for me, I love using it as a way to kind of um, communicate to her how I've caught her doing great things. Like, I, you know, letting her know that I notice when she's being kind or thoughtful or patient or or whatever it is I've seen in her at that particular time. So so that's been really great. Also, I'm just asking open ended questions. Because for me, um, like when I pick my kids up from school, answering questions that can't be answered with just a simple yes or no has that's not my knee jerk. Like I tend to ask those yes, no questions. So really being, again, being deliberate because those yes, no questions like the how was your day? I was finding that to be really ineffective and (laughs) Also, quite honestly, very annoying to my exhausted, hungry teens at the end of a long school day. So um, instead of asking that kind of question, what I try to lean towards is more stuff like, who did you sit with at lunch? Or um, what's one interesting thing that you learned today? Or uh, what's one fun thing that happened today? And, And also doing things like high, low, high point of the day, low point of the day. The other thing that I found is figuring out what my kids' windows are and and that's figuring out the time of day when they're most open to communicating and sharing. And my previous example of asking open-ended questions, I will say I do not have a whole lot of luck with my kids right after school. They're usually tired and hungry. But then again, I know other um, moms who've talked about they don't really do carpool because that in the car on the way home time is when their kids open up. So it just depends, you know, on your child and when that window is and you've got to figure it out. Know when it's open and know when it's shut. Now for my kids, Both of them really tend to open up around bedtime, which, oh my goodness, like some nights I'm so tired that I can barely keep my eyes open. But I'm so grateful when they really want to share and talk and discuss their day or tell me what's going on. And they're very conversational that um, I really make the extra effort and push to to stay awake and, and hang with them. Not knowing your teen It is a process, right? And you are not always going to get it right. I rarely get it right from what their favorite foods are to who their friends are at the moment. I don't always get it right. And sometimes my mistakes are some doozies, if you know what I mean. Um, I think I shared one last week where um, I, I talked about showing my daughter 13 Reasons Why. There are other times when um, when it's kind of been reversed where I've made a mistake in what I think they can't handle or do. And it's something that they are able to. And I know that's frustrating for them. And it's hard for me as far as letting go and and letting them move on to that next thing that they're ready for. Um, scary movies are definitely a big example there because I still can't watch scary movies. I've learned that about myself. So knowing that they can has been, come slowly and it's something now that they do with their dad that they have a lot of fun doing. Um, but back to that 13 Reasons Why... Again, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago with the experience I have with my daughter where 13 Reasons Why on Netflix was something that she wanted to watch and I had not done my due diligence. And really that whole incident was kind of uh, one of the catalysts that led me to create Connection Not Perfection because I felt so caught off guard with that show and watching it with her because I had not read the book. Um, I had not done my due diligence. And 
So we watched the book and, uh, excuse me, we watched the movie and as we watched it and things unfolded and it was this story of a girl basically reaching back from the grave because she had committed suicide and it was a very graphic depiction of partying and drinking and rape and the after effects of that. There was a very graphic scene of her suicide at the end that just was heartbreaking for me because you see her mom coming and dad coming in and finding her and and the whole thing was so horrific for me and with the way that I process things I was still thinking about it and it would still come to mind weeks later and um, you know right after we watched it my daughter and I were able to have a really good conversation basically after each episode of it where we talked about what had happened and how that fit into her context like her frame of reference that she has or had at 13 and those weeks later when I would come back to it I realized it was something that was haunting me like many things do that's why I can't watch scary movies because you know they things come back and linger in my mind but for her she's just able to, to leave it on the table and walk away and and move on and once she's processed it, she's done. So that is something that I had to learn about her, that I had to get to know about her, that has really helped in our relationship, that she is much more able to kind of be done with something once it's happened, whereas I tend to overanalyze and go back and and think about things and kind of have this circular method of processing versus a linear method of processing. Um, And I will say, too, our conversations were great. I just feel like I need to throw this in here. 13 Reasons Why really chronicles a situation of bullying and sexual assault and suicide. And I feel that there are some other resources out there, some similar books that handle those topics in a different way that maybe comes at it with a a place of a little more strength and redemption. And one of those books, which I did give to my daughter to read, um, offered it to her to read, uh, and she took me up on the offer, was a book called Speak by Lori Hulse Anderson, which was also made into a movie. And it just has a, um, a character who has experienced the same kinds of things, such as bullying and sexual assault, as the main character in 13 Reasons Why. But her response to it and her resiliency within that, within those horrible circumstances, I felt like was a, a much more balanced, or actually, I would say it balanced the 13 Reasons Why version of how to handle those same situations. So they're both valid responses, but the one that I w- wanted to direct my daughter to was the one in Speak, because the girl in that book was able to kind of come back from those things with a lot of hard work and a lot of heartache. But anyway, so setting that aside, I just want to kind of recap a little bit. To truly know your teen, you need to be open to who they're becoming. You need to get outside of your normal routine to be able to engage with them. And you need to be really deliberate in your strategies to connect with them. And along those lines, my freebie this week is a recap of the life hacks that I've shared today, like scheduling weekly dates and taking personality tests together and journal swapping and asking open-ended questions and using the window of time where they are most likely to share with you you. And I've compiled all those as lo- as well as um, some links to some from re- fun resources like online personality tests. And um, I think I threw a link in there that is a that is a great list of open ended conversation starting questions and some book recommendations as well. So that's my freebie for this week. And I would invite you and encourage you to go to theishgirl.com forward slash EP five. So for episode five, to find those resources and, and download them there. And also, I just wanted to point out that I do have a lot of great resources on my Pinterest site 
website, and that is pinterest.com forward slash the ish girl. So you can um, also check out what I have there for you. So again, I would love to just say thank you so much for hanging with me today and um, listening to all of these life hacks and things that you can do to make sure you really know your kid well, that you're staying current and up to date with them. And from an ish girl who can't watch a scary movie to save her life, just remember it is all about connection, not perfection.